your early work was what took this very kind of pragmatic approach right of looking for the correlations between neural activity in the brain and the contents of consciousness is there perhaps you could tell us about what the logic behind that kind of approach and um i don't know if it's possible to condense for a lay audience the uh the kind of the key findings of the neural correlates of consciousness yeah in principle it's relatively straightforward so we it's very difficult the field hasn't converged to anything close sort of to a to general accepted way how to how to deal with consciousness but among those people those scientists that believe consciousness is is as real as anything because of course some philosophers and some scientists believe it's a complete illusion which i simply don't know what that actually is supposed to mean because if it's an illusion we all have it is the most powerful illusion that we have then in what sense is it an illusion Anyhow, so um, um, among scientists who study consciousness, there's no sort of agreement about theories, but we can all agree it's a phenomena. It seems to be associated with particular parts of your body. Now, for the longest, of course, it was thought in the West and in any other culture, it's your heart, right? Most people thought the heart is really the seat of the soul, including famously Aristotle, right? The heart is the seat of valor. And you still, we still have that today in our language. I love you with all my heart, right? or he's wearing his heart, his heart on his sleeve, or he's heartless, right? You see all these statues of Jesus with, the, you know, with this glowing heart. You never see statues of Jesus with a glowing brain. You know, there are all these sacred heart academies, but there isn't a sacred brain academy, okay? Okay, but now we know it's actually the brain. But then we can ask further, well, is it the entire brain? Is it, for example, the spinal cord? The, sp the spinal cord is part of the central nervous system. What happens if you lose it? Well, we know what happens, right? You become paralyzed, you become quadriplegic, you're confined to a, to a um, wheelchair, you know, in the worst case, some machine has to breathe for you. But we know that these people still have conscious uh, sensation. In fact, their consciousness is remarkable little impacted. So that tells us, well, it can't be the entire central nervous system because some of it you can chop off and you still have consciousness. What about cerebellum? 80% of your, of your neurons are in this little brain at the back, right, called the cerebellum. And we know from patients that have stroke or, or tumor, or we know of a handful of patients that were born without a cerebellum, they have all sorts of problems, but they never complain about loss of consciousness. They don't complain about loss of self. They don't complain that they can't see anymore, or can't hear anymore, or can't feel angry or upset anymore. So once again, we can rule out more than 80% of all the neurons in the brain is somehow contributing to consciousness. And so in this way, we can, in principle, at least identify, think with the footprints of consciousness. And really, it's a, it's a very nice, it's almost like the, you know, Plato's cave metaphor, because it, the footprint implies you might not be able to see the person who left them, but you can surely see where that person stepped you know, because you can follow their in their footprint. And so this is what people are trying to do using in animals and in, in uh, humans, using imaging techniques or electrical recordings or EG or MEG or PET, you know, all the, all the dizzying variety of techniques, including drugs, hallucination, hallucinatory drugs, et cetera, et cetera. People try to identify what are the neurophysiological signatures of consciousness? Where do they occur? And what is the timing? Those are really the, the big questions. What is the signature, particularly from the outside? This is also an immensely practical question because in clinical practice, there are, you know, 100,000 people each day that are put to sleep briefly, you know, mercifully during, operate, during surgical intervention. And I need to monitor them. Are they truly out of it or are they just unable to move because they're paralyzed? By, by the drugs I inject, or are they truly unconscious, so I need to monitor them. And our ability to actually monitor consciousness is still very primitive. And then there's thousands of patients who have various loss of consciousness, who may be under, in an unresponsive wakefulness state, in a vegetative state, in a minimal conscious state, where the brain is damaged by drugs or car accidents or whatever. So we, we are simply unable to say using uh, using behavioral measures, whether or not there's anyone home. And so if we have reliable, and people are trying to work towards that, if we had reliable 
signature of consciousness, then we can say, yes, this patient, although they can't move, they can't communicate, they're sort of mute, I can still tell you this patient actually feels like something. This patient is conscious, while that patient over there, there's truly no one home anymore. And so what, what are the signatures? In which part of the brain do they occur? And at what time scale um, do they occur? Those are questions that we can all agree these can be operationalized and we can build machines to to study these and so that's what a lot of people are doing in the clinic and in the uh, in neurosciences and in your work is there a particular um thing that leaps out as as a kind of particularly salient correlate of consciousness like kind of recurrent activity through different brain areas or these 40 hertz oscillations that you wrote about early on in your work yeah, so the, the, the 40 hertz oscillation, so Francis Crick and I had, had hypothesized that um, these particular type of neuronal activity patterns that show up in single cell or multi-unit recording or in EG in the frequency range of 40 hertz, that they are closely associated with consciousness. That turns out, well, they are associated with, but they can also be dissociated from consciousness. And they are more probably more associated with things like attention with selective attention. Now attention and consciousness, they relate to each other, but they can also be dissociated. You can have attention without consciousness and you can be conscious of something without attending to it. And, and so that, that, that guess just turned out to be wrong. You know, empirically the best evidence we have, yes, it, it involves massive recurrent activity. Most of the current evidence I would say points to the back of the cerebral cortex, sort of the what what some people call the posterior hot zone, sort of a higher order occipital, temporal, parietal regions, particular for the forms of consciousness that have been studied best. Uh, seeing, hearing, touching, um, uh, voluntary initiation of actions, things like that. They all seem to be closely associated with the, with the back of the, of, the, of the brain, a particular of the cerebral cortex. So if that's true, that gives rise to a question, well, what is it about cortex that's so magical that it gives rise to feelings? Cortex, of course, is a laminated structure, right? It's like a pizza. It's really pretty, to good approximation, it's like a pizza, 14 inch big, two to three millimeter, just like a pizza with toppings. And it's highly convolved and you have one here and one here, and then they're linked with, you know, 200 million fibers. And, and it's not homogeneous. I mean, to first order, it looks homogeneous everywhere. But if you look at the microconnectivity, it differs a lot between the front and the back. And that might be an explanation why consciousness is primarily here rather than here. Or there may be some other explanation we don't know yet. 